There's an old adage that goes, money doesn't buy happiness. And while I'm inclined to believe this piece of wisdom, as money definitely isn't everything, as the old joke goes, yeah, but I'd rather cry in a luxury car than on a bike. And it's hard to deny that given the choice between being poor and miserable or being rich and miserable, I'd absolutely choose rich. But as things are today, the landscape is becoming harder and harder for people, especially young people, to keep up financially with financial nihilism on the rise. I see it all over social media as confidence in today's system is slowly crumbling before our eyes. I know where you're from, okay? And where you're from, the young people feel like housing is a price out of reach. They feel like access to good jobs is diminishing and where you're from, housing is just too expensive. They feel their politicians are a little too old and out of touch and that they're not adapting to the changes of modern society. Technology is moving so quickly and they haven't been able to regulate it. That's your location. Money doesn't buy happiness. Money isn't everything. Money isn't gonna fix all of your problems. I just paid my rent and I only have $20 left in my account. And my first paycheck for this new job that I just started, that doesn't come through until next week. And I'm running out of gas in the car that I need to use to get to work. If you're rich, stop talking. Okay, stay out of this. Tell me the biggest lie an adult has ever told you and when you figured out it was a lie. Money can absolutely buy happiness. Money can buy happiness. Our parents would raise us to be like, oh, money can't buy happiness. But then we would grow up watching game shows where people are awarded money and what do they do when they get the money, right? They don't look too angry about it, you know what I'm saying? They say like, oh, money can buy you a bed, but it can't buy you any sleep. Come here, every single insomniac right now wouldn't mind a million dollars. You know what I'm saying, right? They tell you like, oh, money can buy you a clock, but it can't buy you time. Yes, it can. Give anybody working a nine to five a lot of money. Now they can take as much time as they want to spend with their loved ones. These little wisdom things aren't working because we can now see money can absolutely buy happiness. You know what I'm saying right now? What's that saying that I love so much, right? They say money can't buy happiness, but poverty can't buy you anything at all. So let's take a look through the lens of Bong Joon-ho's Oscar award-winning masterpiece, Parasite, to try and answer the question. Money may not buy happiness, but does poverty afford misery? But before we begin, I'd like to thank viewers like you for your support. If you're new here and enjoy my content, please like and subscribe as it really helps the channel grow so I can continue making more. Now, back to the video. Despite Parasite coming out a little over five years ago, I find this film to be just as relevant today as when it first released, as things haven't gotten any better. As a brief overview, Parasite is at its core a profound dissection of class disparities in an exploration of moral quandaries between the opulent Park family and impoverished Kim family. Throughout the film, we follow the Kim family as they slowly burrow their way into the park's life. The Kims start off living in a semi-basement apartment in Seoul, folding pizza boxes just to get by. Their poverty is well on display here as they can't afford Wi-Fi, they have a stink bug infection resorting to leaving their windows open in order to get free fumigation, and much more. On the other hand, the Park family lives a life of luxury. They live in a multi-million dollar mansion with maids, chauffeurs, and virtually any need catered to due to their high wealth and status. They are the elite. And generally, when watching Parasite, it forces you to question who exactly is the Parasite? The Kims who leech onto the parks feeding off of the crumbs of their wealth, or the parks who no doubt benefit from a system that keeps the haves from the have-nots, and the have-nots from the have-nothings? But what does this film have to say regarding happiness? Is poverty a damning road to misery? Is wealth the pinnacle of happiness? After all, what's the point of having all that luxury if you're miserable anyways? So who's happier? The Kims? Or the Parks. Let's begin with the Park family. The Park family sits atop of the social hierarchy and are afforded all the spoils of life that comes with that. Their living conditions are better, they have better, more healthy food. The flood that's a life shattering catastrophe for the Kims is nothing more than a minor inconvenience. Their class shields them away from many discomforts and hardships that plague the lower classes, and in some ways, they're completely detached from the realities of modern day working class people. 
much less unhoused people. It's seemingly the life we'd all wish to live, although I think the parts are actually deeply dissatisfied by many aspects of their life. With such high standards, they lose sight of many simple things that even the Kims take for granted. For instance, the Parks aren't really a connected family. Mr. and Mrs. Park aren't really involved in their children's lives. Because they're able to hire a tutor for their daughter or a therapist for their son, they themselves are not as connected with them comparatively as the Kim family. Wealth may liberate them from monetary issues, but it separates them from connecting with the people that matter around them. Money becomes both more and less of a focus for the parks. They don't have to worry about how much they spend. They don't fear being on the brink of one bad day that turns their life upside down, but they actively use it as a differentiator between them and those they look down on. This is one thing I've always found immensely interesting about Parasite. It's because despite what you think about the Kims and what they did to get their jobs, they were really capable of fulfilling all the roles in the house that they took, even creating a new job with Jessica as the art therapist. Yes, they ultimately lied and connived their way into every position they had, but that didn't mean they were incompetent at their jobs. The Kims weren't unable to quote-unquote pull themselves up by their bootstraps, even though, ironically, that's literally impossible, because they were lazy and incompetent workers, but because the Parks and people like them would never even give them the opportunity. The Parks resented the Kims, not even personally, but on a broader socioeconomic scale. The smell that the Parks so disliked on the Kims, the smell of poverty, is the most clear manifestation of this. They did their jobs well, they didn't cross a line, at least not that they knew of. They were obedient and the Parks were satisfied, but the Parks just couldn't shake off their innate disgust of the lower class. Which to me has always seemed like a bit of a catch-22, because the Parks need the lower classes like the Kims for their lifestyle. The relationship between the Parks and the Kims is actually that the Parks need the Kims way more than the other way around, i.e. The parks don't get maid service, expensive art tutors, or chauffeurs if not for those pushed so far down, they'd kill for the opportunity to eat the crumbs off the plate of the parks. Which brings my focus to the Kims. The Kims aren't a neutral party here. They are the lens in which we see the film progress and for most, likely have the more relatable plight. But exploring this idea of the cross-section between poverty and happiness, what does Parasite have to say on that? Well, it's hard to say. The Kims actually never come off as particularly happy people. They too put a great emphasis on money and how much they make, or more like how little they make, which I believe robs them from the joys and fulfillment that comes from free things in life that they do have over the parks, such as being a connected family. But at the same time, I do understand it. Considering how close they live on the edge and sinking down even lower is a very real fear they face on the daily, I don't think I would be any different. And studies have shown that there is a correlation between money and being happier due to many different factors. So which is it? Does poverty buy misery or not? What if anything is Parasite trying to say in regards to happiness and poverty? Well, I think it's this. Ultimately, money does, for most people, buy happiness. Kinda. That's because in order to have happiness, you need to have some basic needs met first. It's hard to be overwhelmingly happy if you have no food, you're consistently unable to pay for bills, or your family is on the brink of homelessness. All things that the Kims face. So of course they feel money would make them happy, because most of their problems stem from not having basic needs met. But this only goes so far. The Parks are so wealthy, they never worry about not having their needs met. Yet all that money doesn't help because they still need drugs to get high, they don't really connect with their children, and Mr. Park's ego is so inflated he can't even have a real conversation with anyone he believes is beneath him. Money may not buy happiness, but it will always take away more than it's worth if you allow it, no matter how much you have. Thanks for watching. Peace.